Hello, and welcome to the Copy Blogger Podcast. My name is Tim Stoddart. Thank you so much for joining me. A few months ago, I stumbled across the work of Eric Jorgensen. Eric had recently published his best selling book entitled The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. In this book, Eric breaks down and articulately conceptualizes the business concepts of leverage, which were introduced to him by a very popular Twitter thread written by Naval Ravikant. Leverage is a word that gets thrown around a lot, but how do you actually define this concept? More importantly, how do you use leverage to generate massive scale in your business? These days, it's not uncommon for a one-person business to generate a million dollars of revenue. It's not uncommon for a billion-dollar company to have only 10 to 15 employees. How is this possible? In this episode, Eric gives us an in-depth masterclass on leverage. In addition, we went through some of the specific modules in his course, and he gave us a behind-the-scenes look at the material he teaches. This is a special privilege given to you as a member of the copy blogger community. Eric was great. He's generous, kind, and easy to talk to. Check out his course at ejorgensen.com slash leverage. The link to his course is in the show notes of this podcast, which can be found anywhere you listen to podcasts. I'm excited for you to listen to this episode. Please help me welcome Eric Jorgensen. What's up, Eric? Thank you so much for joining me on my show. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Cool, man. Uh, well, you and I were talking a little bit before we started recording. Um, however, this particular circumstance, I think, needs to be put in some kind of documentation. Where the <laughs> hell are you and what is going on behind you? Oh, yeah, I got a little bit of an away game situation. So I'm, I'm uh, at University of Missouri, Kansas City this week. Uh, kicking off kind of a tech stars cohort. Um, so there's a bunch of awesome companies downstairs kind of working on pitches and meeting mentors and stuff. Um, and I just like snuck up here to this weird little conference room and barricaded myself in with a bunch of chairs. And hopefully we get through this without <laughs> me interrupting somebody doing something important. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Uh, well, as I said before, thank you so much for, for taking some time out of your busy schedule and, and chatting with us. Uh, all right, so let's get into it. I start every episode with the same question. The background photo on your Twitter. Tell me about what it is and what it means to you. I cannot remember what the background photo of my Twitter is right now. I remember I've got like three or four. I used to have one that was like an American flag in the back of a boat. I had one that was like the Tesla that got shot into space. Yeah. Uh, looking back at Earth. Oh, it's my book now. Really. <laughs> um, I, should, I should probably know that. Um, yeah, it's the it's the like banner thing like a little graphic that scribe made me for uh for my book after it became a amazon bestseller yeah first off congratulations Thank with you. that um great idea great topic and i was even thinking like man how many times has eric been on podcasts talking about his book um and so i i have a lot of material that i want to cover that is more so about some of the topics and the ideas that you promote, which I think is actually going to be like more useful to everybody than talking about the book itself. Uh, you know, but while we're on the subject, um, your book is called The Almanac of Naval Ravikant. Um, I'm sure most people know who he is. Naval got very famous on Twitter, especially um, through some of these ideas and some concepts that a lot of people like you and myself have, have found a lot of value from. And so on that note, I want to hear about like the manifestation of this book. I always find it to be a fascinating conversation because there are some things where you can just take an idea and sit down for a couple hours and then you have something. But with books in particular, there's a very long process. It's very focus oriented. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me about like that moment where you had the idea and, and the process of going from idea to bestseller. Yeah, I, I kind of painted myself into a corner a little bit by like having this idea and tweeting it when it was like a very tiny kernel of an idea that I not really considered. And uh, I woke up to find that Naval had retweeted my half-assed idea and wow. like 5,000 people were like, oh yeah, we want that. Like, please make it. And Naval was, you know, willing to support that and kind of was like, yeah, go ahead. I was like, oh, well, 
this this idea this got very real very quickly um and so you know this is my first book i had i had done a lot of writing but uh never a book before and so i just kind of you know, I was a little naive. I was like, oh, okay, this will be like a six month project. And like three years later, I publish a book. Um, so yeah, it took a long, it took me a long time to wrap my head around like what the medium meant and like figure out all of the details of it. And it's one of those things is like, you know, you, it's hard to continue sometimes. And then you, you look back at how far you've come and you're like, man, I can't give up now. can't give up now. Um, and so you just kind of find some more energy to keep moving and uh, every step like builds on itself. And then you, you got something great at the end of a, bunch of work there's a lot of people in copy blogger that have dreams of publishing a book myself included mm. frankly um i think it's it's that it's a grandiose idea right it's kind of like the writer's version of of making it onto the big screen uh what about for my own like selfishness being able to live vicariously for you like what has it felt like to have something that you wrote that you put together that has been accepted by by your peers and other writers as to be like a really great piece of work uh i mean it, it's it's real cool um but i can't I, I don't give myself a lot of credit for this because yeah. like all of the i think most of what people get the value out of is, is naval's ideas right like all the brilliance in here is like the raw material that naval has spent his life kind of distilling um and I, you know i had great puzzle pieces to work with and uh, worked hard at Kind of making something beautiful out of them and making them accessible and putting it into kind of like a professional published polished thing for people um but i don't i don't get like this i don't get like the same as, the, as a, a writer also like mm -hmm. i don't get the validation of like wow like people love my writing um i, I only really have that for like the my, my editing process in yeah. this which I'm, I'm legitimately proud of and work hard on um but it is a little different than like you know, dreaming of putting out a novel and like putting out, a, you know, putting out a novel and having people love it. Um, that's like this very creative work. That's interesting to hear. There's another side of me that thinks uh, I would feel the same way. I don't want to say like, you're not giving yourself enough credit. I think what's going through my mind right now is that in the last 10 years, let's say the value of being a curator has mm -hmm. like skyrocketed just because there's so much out there and there's so many people that are saying so many things and right like 99% of them are probably worthless with respect to everybody that's tweeting 8,000 times a day. And, uh, <laughs> and so the, it's like Seth Godin says, it's, it's the emotional labor, right? We're not digging ditches. Mm -hmm. We're like having that internal battle with ourselves. and like, how the hell do I take all of this and format it in a way that is valuable to people? So, so the the curation element i i do think presents like a, a different skill set yeah tell me where i'm wrong there no i mean i i totally agree with that and i i think um that's been something i kind of think about because I'm, I'm naturally like much more of a curator like i love i love um and, and i think of it like a spectrum right like i think you're totally right that the need for curation has gone up and and like yeah. will continue to go up maybe even faster than the rate of creation. So as fast as people are creating new stuff, curation gets even more important to like distill out that stuff and um, help people find the most important thing for them. And that's been kind of a theme in like my side project career, at least is, is curation. Um, and I think it also comes maybe a little more naturally to people earlier in their career. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're trying to learn and you just don't have a lot of like, I don't have a lot of like, as many battle wounds as like Naval does and life experiences and stuff like that. And so I kind of, um, I feel like it's a little bit my role in the ecosystem right now to like be work on the craft of curation and sharing and compilation. Um, but I do think it's a, it's a spectrum too, right? I, I think one of the things I've learned is like spending so much time on the curation side of things is I start to see creation as just like a very, very advanced form of curation um and all the creators are really sort of pulling inspiration from a ton of different places and whether they even recognize it consciously or not is maybe less relevant even like it's just they are all a product of all their experiences and all their inspirations and all the people that they've learned from um and so i see it as a spectrum and i expect yeah. to kind of move along that spectrum for different projects at different points in my life um but I, I, you know, I still try to like be honest with myself about what I'm doing. 
I think that is such a cool thing for you to say. It's uh, still like an artist, right? Like Austin Kleon made mm-hmm. an entire series around the idea that like there's really no such thing as original ideas anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, and there's, I, I find especially with writers, just because writing is so hard, that there's a huge pressure on ourselves, on yourself to come up with something unique right? Like, oh, that's already been said before. Like, I want to be known for something in particular. Like, what is my brand, you know? And um, I think it takes time just because you have to almost get comfortable with the idea that like, you're not that special and you're Mm -hmm. not going to do, well, I shouldn't say that. I don't want to diminish originality, but I think what you're trying to say, and I'm, I'm agreeing with you, is that there's just as much value in taking things that have already been said and creating your own spin, your own format, your own way of like presenting that information. Uh, because you're it, you, in, in the same respect, like you can curate one person's stuff and put it in a particular format, or you can curate like 10 people's stuff and build an idea around that. Like me, I'm just a byproduct of Seth Godin, basically, Brian Clark, who's my partner, a copy blogger. Um, I got a lot of inspiration from Mike Rowe, actually, the Dirty Jobs mm, guy. He's like, that guy's really, awesome. He's so cool, right? And he's a great storyteller and like he doesn't take himself too seriously. And and really between the three of them, that has been like and a combination with myself and my own identity. That has been how I have found my voice, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think it's good to talk about that. Yeah, I, I, that like a pattern that I keep seeing from people who who become like really, really good at their craft is that they spent time shamelessly copying people that they admire basically <laughs> and until they like get an intuitive feel of what it's like to produce that kind of work and like yep. then it becomes adapted to their personality um so it, it like it is a longer journey that feels you know you <laughs> you can't skip to year 10 um and it like feels maybe like a little gross to just like when you start out just copying somebody's work like that's not what you want to be doing um but i think it's helpful to understand that that's like a very normal uh, and probably expected like stage of, of what you got to do. Agree. Totally. Well, thank you so much for that insight. Uh, I'm going to switch it up a little bit. I want to talk about some of the actual ideas. Uh, you write about this in your blog a lot. The uh, ideas that Naval put forward are, are all pretty similar to, I think you've, what we just talked about, you may have molded yourself around some of these ideas. So, yeah. uh, you speak a lot about leverage and this form of leverage has been all over the internet for the past five years, but I I think people still don't quite get it because they look at it as like a shortcut rather than a tool to be used and, and, and like a frame of thinking. So I'm not looking for like a particular answer here. I'm, I'm looking as to how, this idea of leverage and this idea of like specialization versus generalization first came into your mind frame and like how you have applied that into your life. Yeah. Um, I don't know the, the leverage, I think you're, you're totally right. Like leverage is a mindset and, a and a frame, a set of ideas. Um, and that it's an easy thing to feel like you look at it at first glance and you're like, Oh, okay, I get it. Um, and if it doesn't change how you make decisions and how you approach your work, um, it, it is easy to underestimate, I guess, uh, kind of in the same way that like compounding is easy to like, someone explains it to you and you're like, oh yeah, cool, I get it. Um, but if you take it seriously, it can come to completely define your life and your decisions and your outcome. And it's one of those things that feels too small to be important for the first kind of few times, that you know, first few periods of compounding or the first few, you know, months or years of working towards building leverage but when you see people who are later on in that journey whether it's compounding or in building leverage they have what seems like an impossible amount like an impossible outcome Mm -hmm. um and it's just that process of looking at how that has been built slowly and methodically and the time that it took to do that and the attention and the mindset and decisions that go into that Um, so these people they get to like what seem like impossible or unfair things are just thinking about it slightly differently. I don't think most of them aren't working, you know, that much harder than the average person. They, they may not even be that much smarter. They just have this simple idea that they let kind of guide their decisions and they, they take it seriously and they let it run for a long period of time. I was just, 
I'm doing a, a four week course right now on, uh, on Brian Clark's other brand called unemployable. And I've run an agency for years and, uh, I've had this really particular mindset about it where what's, what's one of the downsides that everyone talks about with agencies, right? Like you get burned out and you're dealing with clients all the time. And I've been really, really trying to apply some of these principles where it's like, if you're working more, the bigger you get, then you're totally doing it wrong. And Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the visualizations that I put together, because when it comes to leverage, like you had this great visualization on your blog with the seesaw with the one oh, guy yeah. holding up like 50 people. And I'm reminded of uh, a, I don't know, sixth or seventh grade, it was a science class. And I remember this guy saying like, by the end of this film, I'm going to push this train with one hand. And he's pushing against it. If people can see me on video, he's got both his hands and like, he's really leaning into it with his feet. And then by the end of it, he's just got a lever which is a stick with some kind of gear, like force Mm -hmm. ratio multiplier on the end of it. And he sticks it under the wheel and he pulls it down. And then the train moves two inches. And for me, once I was able to actually visualize it, like, oh, I get it. Leverage is the tool. Leverage is just the thing that I stick on the wheel of the train so that when I pull it, the force that like my muscles create is multiplied times like, I don't know how much, 10,000. And I can move this impossibly heavy train that I wouldn't be able to move on, on myself. Just elaborate on that for me. Yeah, I think the um, the visuals help so much. Like I try to get get decent at uh, like drawing some of the graphics and showing that. Um, I think for some people the math helps too. That's like you can't lift eight hundred pounds. Most people can't just like walk up and lift eight hundred pounds. You might be able to do because I've seen your your workout fleets and your beast. <laughs> I but, can't uh, lift eight hundred pounds. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. That's really flattering. <laughs> uh, I can't either. Um, but w- maybe one day uh, there. So there's like, but with a 20 foot lever, like almost anybody, like the average person can yeah. lift, can lift 800 pounds. Um, and I think it's easy to like glaze over that. And if someone comes around and tells you like, you too can lift 800 pounds, you're just like, yeah, fuck you. Like I'm checking out. Like that's not real. Um, but, but it is like, as you say, like it's a mindset to, not just dismiss the possibility, but start looking for looking for those leverage opportunities. And they come, you know, in, in many forms, right? Like, as you said, like there's tools, like literally physical tools that can increase the amount of work that you can do per hour. Um, there's products like podcasts and writing and books and media and movies. Um, there's people. So you built an agency, you know that like you start consulting and you can only work so many hours a week, but when yeah. you hire somebody, you can build out that team, you get more billable hours or you build an audience. And all of a sudden it's not just you talking about you, like people can share things that they appreciate on your behalf. Um, and then the fourth way is capital. So when you, when you get some money, you can put it to work for you and like buy assets that are, that are working for you or invest in it back into those other tools and products and people that can help kind of get more work done. And I think, you know, I, I've been trying to distill this, into as few words as I can. And I think maybe the two most helpful things that I have so far are just like leverage is the art of accomplishing more. And, and it's focusing on doing the work that gets more work done. So just looking at that, believing first that you can change over time, your, your efforts to output ratio, Mm. and then spending the time to do the work that changes that ratio. So that in a month or a year, when you spend an hour working on something, you know, you publish it to 10,000 people or a hundred thousand people instead of, instead of a hundred, or, you know, you record the same podcast, but it goes out to many more, or, you know, you, you push an update to your users and it, you know, increases the price of your product or all of these things. I think, you know, leverage is inherent in what most writers do, but they may not think of it that way. Yeah. Um, so especially I think for, for the writers in the <clears throat> audience, like it's worth taking some time to step back and think about how you're, how you're building leverage over time. And that's one of the fearful things about this mindset is in order to do it, you have to like, stop doing what you're doing right now. And I really think that's like the trap, especially with the agency, right? It's like, how on earth can I possibly do this when I have seven clients emailing me every day? And like, I'm always I call it feeding the beast. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can only look as far as the next email, the next invoice is being sent to. And you know what? Um, I'll actually give myself a little shout out right here because as you were <laughs> saying that, uh, I wrote in my blog, I read a morning blog post every day and uh, something I wrote yesterday, or it was two days ago, seemed to really resonate. 
do you know, I'm, I'm totally going to butcher his name. And I talked to him on Twitter sometimes, and, I, and I'm sure you know this. K Hi, K H E H Y is his last name. Yeah, yeah. The 10K work guy. I don't know. For sure. Yeah, the 10K yeah. work guy. Yeah. And so uh, what I was really distilling from it is that one of the cool things about it is when you start applying the 10K work mindset, right? And you start applying the, the work that you do today that's going to have an exponential payoff in the future. What it reminded me of is all of the really long form blog posts that I wrote on Stadzi on my agency, because mm -hmm. you publish a blog and nothing really happens, <laughs> right? And it's the uh, exact opposite of, you know, okay, yeah, hire me right now. Like I'm going to make this design and I'm going to send it to you and, and I'm going to bill you for it. Like that's a one-to-one mm -hmm. -one type thing. And, uh, and three years down the line, you know, my site probably, although there's others, I'm sure, but I, I think I can confidently say that it's probably like the most um, authoritative marketing educational website out there for healthcare. And now all of that shit that I spent three years working on is worth who knows how much, like 300 times the hours that I spent on it. And so again, mm -hmm. once you see that visualization that the work that you do now has a uh, disproportionate payoff in the future, I, I think that helps like motivate people to take a step back and be like, okay, let me stop sending these invoices for this hour that I just built for and actually build something that can like work for me in a, in a time, in, in a future, in a future moment. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's part of the power of that writing is that like that lives on and you can reference back to it. It's building traffic. It, like your writing is out there advertising for you yeah. every minute of the day. And um, all of that, it, each additional post that you make compounds. Like how, how long have you been doing your daily blog? Uh, well, my personal blog, um, man, I've been doing that for years. I, I wish I was daily on it for years. Yeah. I don't. There's some days where I'm just like, I'm not doing this today. <laughs> you know I mean? um, yeah, but, but yeah, that's amazing. I built a real writing habit on on Tim Stodds, but on Stodzy on the agency, I've I've published like a three thousand word article at least every other week on tough stuff to write about. You know, yeah. like really sales oriented type material that, like, I don't have a sales team. I don't need to hire sales employees. I literally mm -hmm. have a website that doesn't even like really exist in like the, the physical world yeah driving phone calls to me every day and um and it's ideal yeah that's amazing you know no ongoing costs like you just kind of deposited that in there and i'm sure um i mean correct me if i'm wrong but you probably wrote when you were writing those posts it was like helping you work through a client problem or process something sure. and it was like you know um i think to your point of people like have a hard time not just feeding the beast like most of this stuff does double duty if you can find a way to like, yeah, it's client work, but like, you know, you put it in your contract, like after six months, I can put it on my portfolio or I can publish a case study on this, or you just kind of keep an eye open for ways to create those, you know, especially in this context, like those assets that work for you mm -hmm. um, or ways to capture client testimonials, like somewhat automatically, or, you know, record your brainstorming sessions and just like, publish them on your site as a, you know, kind of a transparency piece or um, I, there's a million ways to do it for each individual business. But I think people underestimate it, um, especially over the long haul. You know, it may take, like you said, three years to like let this work compound and build. And, you know, if you keep changing directions every six months, you might not see those results. Mm -hmm. um, but over time, like those levers get longer and longer and longer. Mm -hmm. And so it's like not that exciting to, get a tiny little lever that goes and lifts 200 pounds and you're like, I can lift 200 pounds. That doesn't mean anything. But like the fact that that lever gets longer month over month over month. And when you come back in nine months, you can lift 800, like that gets pretty exciting. And then like lifting a thousand pounds and you come back and like lift in a truck, like after two or three years of work, metaphorically, um, that's, that's exciting. Um, easy for granted because it happens so slowly, but it's, it's like a tiny little miracle that's available to you. Um, yeah. just, just let that seed grow. Cool. And um, I do want to move on to this topic of, of specialization versus generalization, because I think that's also very important. But I want to stay on this for just a little bit longer. Give me just a moment. I'm going to read uh, from one of your blog posts, because I do think what we talked about before this idea, this idea of leverage being an idea, 
mm-hmm. um, and something that people need to like conceptualize as important. So I'm just going to read this and then feel free to extrapolate. Leverage is a mental model, an idea to guide decision making. A mental model is a simple idea that represents a big, complicated, and important idea. The simple idea is easier to remember and act on as we go about our work. There are many mental models, inversion, compounding, 80-20 principle, principal agent problem, many, many models. But this post is about leverage and personal leverage. So here's my definition of leverage. And this, this really stuck out to me. Leverage are for, force multipliers. Leverage is the art of accomplishing more. Technically, this is about changing the effort, the effort slash impact ratio. And that is so cool when you actually say it that way. Achieving the same result with less time or achieving significantly more with the time you have. So, yeah, I mean, we've, we've gone pretty in depth about this topic, but um, I, I thought that was just a great summarization. And what I wanna finish on this is if somebody is listening to this and they think, damn, I, I, I quit my job to be my own boss and now I'm working 70 hours a week and I got 12 clients totally breathing down my neck, right? Like how would somebody practically, like what are the instructions for them to take a step back and say like, okay, how can I start applying this so I can really start like buying my time back? Just give some advice there. Yeah, I mean, th- this is the exact kind of situation that I was in like a little more than a year ago, which is kind of like what led me down this path. Like I got pushed into this idea because I went from like one and a half jobs to five jobs very quickly for like, whatever, it's a long story. But like all of a sudden I had a impossible amount to do on a daily mm-hmm. basis for like yeah. for my family and my business and my job and everything. Um, and it just instantly sort of uh, forced me to change how I approached everything that I did. And I got it was a messy process, but like I got better at using these frameworks and prioritizing. And I had loved this idea of leverage from the book, but I didn't really, I didn't really have a great methodology for applying it yet. And so I kind of forced myself to figure it out and it was like clumsy and messy. And I have now kind of like tried to capture, as I've built out this like course and community, I've tried to pull what happened like in my subconscious into a replicatable process, like for myself and for others. So I can't, you know, it's not like I've been doing this for 10 years, but I have been through it very recently. And I really love pulling people together that are going through the same thing um, and, and like helping everybody develop like a common language so that we can all help each other go through this. And so it's really like my advice to people is um, I think this this work happens kind of at two levels um, and we go, we, we got like frameworks for this kind of in detail in the course but there's ways to look at it at a problem level. So you're sitting in front of one specific problem or opportunity. And our method there is to like bring solutions, reframing the problem as many times as you need to along the way, and then triage those by whether they are leveraged solutions or not. Um, A lot of instinctive kind of first responses aren't gonna be high leverage solutions, especially for people who are kind of new to this idea. But once you've been through a few iterations, you get to something really good. Um, and then the other is, is kind of at a broad, like a broad level. So especially relevant for this person who's kind of, you know, 12 clients, 70 hour weeks, no time to breathe, you know, try to get 20 minutes and like, just map out like your problems and your opportunities in in leverage by type. So, um, you know, our, our framework for this that we use in the course is like, it's pretty simple. It's four columns you know, tools, product, people, capital, and what leverage is actually working for us now, what's available to us. Um, And that really like, you know, you you got a problem that's top of mind and you start inventorying what you have and what's available. And it's, it's a simple tool, but it's amazing how often you make new connections or see new opportunities. Um, And when you're doing it in this, this mindset, you solve problems in like a much more permanent way. So you stop putting out fires and you start um, kind of preventing them or building fireproof assets or things like that. Um, and it's really exciting to see, you know, we have such a variety of people in the community. So we have developers and writers and entrepreneurs and investors and um, people running agencies and all, all kinds. And everybody has like an inherent talent or a bias towards like one or two of those types. Mm-hmm. And they're just totally blind to, to others or feel like they don't have the skill set to use them. Um, and so everybody's kind of helping each other, like unblock skills or access things that are like, 
you know, one guy's got like 21 step Zapier process that like runs his entire business for him, but like has no idea how to hire or manage or bring on new people. But somebody who's like running an agency knows exactly how to do that, but no idea what's available to them in the software tooling side of things. And somebody who's a writer or podcaster is like, yo, like you guys, got it. you don't need to have to like hire salespeople or like, look at what my content like engine can do for you. Uh, so it's really cool to see everybody kind of like share those expertise and bring each other along and share their recipes and problems that they solve. Okay. I changed my mind because I love getting into some nitty gritty stuff. I I'm going <laughs> to map this out as well. I'm not going to give away too much because I'm going to point people to your course, which they should definitely buy, but we got products, tools, people, and capital. You said, yeah, I use a slightly different order, but that's yeah. Tools, what is it? tools, product, people, capital. Okay. So I think one of the first places that people start is with tools and a great example um, is like invoicing software. It's mm. crazy how much time automated invoicing will get you, especially for people that are just starting out that say, damn, I can't spend the 70 bucks a month on QuickBooks right now. I'm just going to make an invoice template on Word. And like in the beginning, that's what you got to do. I'm not, mm -hmm. everybody's got to start there. But I think a good example of tools would be QuickBooks. Am, am I getting that right? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. And, and when you look at it, that would like, if the main stressor in your life is like, oh God, it's an 8 p.m. and I've got to like, I got to go do another hour and a half of invoicing that you're doing every week or every month. Like the, not only do you save the time from doing it, but you save the stress of having that additional thing to keep track yes. of. And if you can, if you are reliably billing your time at X rate, um, that's another other exercise we go through in the course is like mapping out your hourly rate and your aspirational hourly rate and using that as a guide for making some of these decisions. Like when you think about QuickBooks, you're like, Ugh, I don't, like I'm a frugal person. Like I do not love spending money. And so 70 bucks a month to me is like an easy no, like $0 a month. I'll take that all day. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, that's eight hours. Like that is a, I am spending a value of $800 a month for a tool that I can buy back all the time for 70 and not have to think about it anymore because it's automated. Um, so it's shifting some of that stuff from like whatever instincts you have to like changing, turning those instincts into like making leverage decisions and understanding that your time is like the fundamental denominator of all of this. And if you can put the tools and the products and the people to work for you, buy back that time, whether you use it for work or leisure or just be with your family, like this is your business, but like, like, you know, understand all these opportunities that are available to you. And like, you know, there's somebody standing there trying to sell you the thing that's going to help you move the train. So like, let them, let them sell it to you and move that train. This is so fun. Okay. So then what's the difference between tools and product? Okay. So this is a common one. Product product is like a confusing word to people because they're so used to thinking of like software products. Yeah. Um, I think of, or, or I define product in the course as a a product of your mind or experience or talent or skill. So these are usually digital sort of, uh, I call them like thin digital clones of you that are purpose built. Mm. So like this podcast is a product of this hour that we have spent together and it is going to be served up to people in parallel and well into the future. Um, if you write an algorithm and encode it, that's a product of you. If you write a tweet, if you write a blog post, if you write a screenplay or a movie like that is you creating a product that can then go function independently on your behalf got it i love that and I, i'm interested in your viewpoint on people as well i've thought about people a lot simply because for for stasi we drew it like an assembly mm -hmm. line basically and we actually drew it on a board and we said like, okay, these are the five departments. It comes here with me as the marketing and sales and then design and development and invoicing and then account management and, and client services, right? That's exactly where it is. Yep. And so I have seen, and basically through my own experience learned that when you bring on new people, the goal is to make it so it's not one person plus one person equals twice the amount of output. I, I, and this is just my experience. I'm interested to hear yours. My experience is that you want to find people that fit 
a very, very, very specific role so that that role can be like replicated many, many, many times with the constraint of time that, that people have. So for me, I try to make it so that like, if I'm one person and my output is one and I have another person whose output is one, how can the two of them form like one thing whose output might be like five or even 10? So I've, I've thought about this a lot and I've had a really, really hard time explaining it in a way that is simple. It seems like you've also done this and you've come up with some really like quaint little packages to present it to people. So how, how would somebody who's in this stage of hiring think about it to get more output? Yeah, I mean, so I don't, I don't wanna to pretend to be an expert in the agency world because um, I'm, I'm anything but. Uh, just the, any yeah. world of so the people. The, the people, um, the people word is, is pretty carefully chosen. And I think the instinct, um, I, you know, Naval originally called it labor and I re reframed it to people because I wanted to include um, a much, there's so much broader uh, types of leverage than like direct employee employer. Um, mm. So even in the world of, of compensated leverage, like hiring a full-time employee is like scary and intimidating and expensive and high commitment. And you're like, Oh my God, like, I'm feeding someone else's family. Like I better go bring in some business. Like what if this doesn't go well? It's just very, um, there's a lot tied up in it logistically paperwork wise, you know, the economics of it, the psychology of it is very, very challenging. And so I think it's, it's helpful to realize that that is like, that is actually like step nine and that there's a lot more accessible, um, sort of low risk ways to build, to use people leverage, um, and start applying that and get like, uh, practice with it and confidence with it and like know that you're going to get the results that you need when you do go hire someone and put them in that role um and so i think you know that might start with something as, as simple as like fiverr or mechanical turk and hiring people yeah. for very well-defined task-based things where like you know if you hire somebody full-time and it goes poorly like that's a five-digit mistake probably um let alone the headache and the time and the heartache and you know somebody does something that sucks on Fiverr, like eh, it's 10 bucks, not a big deal. Like on to the next one. Um, and there's a lot of ways to get access to kind of like part-time or predefined labor or to hire agencies or to hire specialists or to hire, um, you know, service companies. Like, you know, when I published this book, I, there's a lot of people who helped publish this book who, you know, there's, there's a few names on the front of the book. There's a lot more in the back. And this is a huge team effort between like friends and peer readers and copy editors, and line editors, and project managers, and um, page layout and cover design. And like, there is so much, um, you know, anything you see that is professional and polished and like, there's usually a lot of people contributing to that. Um, and there's a lot of skilled people who are very willing to kind of do their role. Um, and you end up with like this fractional employment thing. So, and that's, that's just, and then you can progress from, you know, very basic stuff up to when you feel confident investing in a full-time person, you know, suddenly when you're spending, you, you hire a part-time contract with 30 hours a week, that's not a scary leap to go 10 more hours a week. Like you've already passed most of the, it doesn't feel like a giant scary thing anymore. Um, but I'll also say like people leverage includes this whole wor big world of uncompensated leverage, right? Like there's people that you employ, but then there's people who just are excited to kind of be a part of what you're doing and they almost they're either learning from you or like find some self-expression and following along and enjoying and supporting you and so like some of the highest leverage people in the world aren't the ones with the biggest number of employees they're the people with the biggest fan groups or the biggest followings or um things like that so i, I encourage people to just kind of like get a big broad picture of of what's available to them in terms of people um and find the right kind of next step for you uh, rather than feel like, if you feel like you gotta do a ton of kind of like learning and studying and you gotta pick up like four or five new skills at once, like if you maybe like yeah. try to make too big of a leap and there may be a, a safer, smaller next step that will help you kind of close that gap. Yeah, really excellent um, quantifier as well. Like how do I know if I'm not using people leverage, if I'm trying to fill like five or six different skill sets? or anybody is, you know, um, yeah. were you going to say something? No, no, I think that's good. I mean, I think it, um, that, that, that de-risks it a little too. Um, but I, like the people, 
the other underrated thing about people leverage, I think is, and where your kind of like one plus one equals five thing comes from, is finding people who can unlock new forms of leverage that you don't have the skills to necessarily. And so if you are one and you're working on building leverage and you can build leverage to like two or three, and you find a partner who's, you know, let's say you're really good at people leverage and product, and you find a guy who's like really good with tools and really good with capital, and you make him your co-founder, like you are now two. And if each of you are levered and levering each other, like now all of a sudden you're five, six, seven, um, because you don't have those bottlenecks of like weaknesses in a particular yeah. type of leverage that's holding them back. Such a cool thing to think about, especially when it comes to web developers, right? Well, that's not true. Any content creator, anybody, it, it all has their own thing. It's just me by myself. I can sell basically anything, but I can't develop a website for shit. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, like you bring in a web developer and now like the me that is me is multiplied by this other thing behind it. So I know it gets like a little meta, right? And you kind of start spinning in circles, but. Yeah, I mean, but, I think this is why like why Combinator does not love like one single solo founders. Yeah, Like it's just too easy for one person to have, to not have all of the breadth of skills that they need. Yeah. And so when you get two or three people together with complementary skills, all of a sudden you can you can build leverage in all of these different things. You can build software and sales and relationships and manage capital well and find the right tools all at the same time. And then like that growth funds itself. And all of a sudden you get these kind of crazy exponential outcomes. Yeah, excellent. All right, so we got one more. We got a couple of minutes left here. I wanna make sure we give a shout out to your course as well because this material is like so, so valuable for people to get more time in their lives. But I think capital is probably the one that is uh, the most easy for most of us to understand. I mean, we're all basically living in a capitalist society. I think what I really clicked for me was that capital doesn't have to be huge investments, right? When, mm -hmm. when for me, I'm speaking for myself, you know, I grew up like pretty blue collar, probably like lower middle income. And so I always thought of money like, oh, well, that's for those other people, right? Like that's never me. I'm just swinging a hammer all day. But eventually you realize that like 20 bucks a month adds up over the course of 20 years. Mm -hmm. You realize that, I mean, that QuickBooks thing is a good example. Like 70 bucks a month turns into tens and tens and tens of hours that get to be applied to something else, which provides mm -hmm. at, at a rate. So I'm setting you up a little bit here, but how would, again, this person in, in this particular position who's trying to just make a, a couple steps forward, start applying capital? Yeah, I, mean, I think what you said is a really good starting place. I mean, you, you, you have to appreciate that eventually, if you, if you stick with this game, like your capital can work harder than you can. Yeah. And it's going to take a while and you got to have faith that you're going to get there. Um, but you'll never get there if you don't if you don't just like suffer through it for a little while when it doesn't look like it's making progress um and it feels just kind of trivially small um but ca so capital in my framework is is uh, kind of goes in two directions one is like it buys you more of the other types of leverage yeah so you know the way that you're applying leverage each form has its own kind of margin and you should be using you know that your people that you're hiring or the products that you're creating or the tools that you're buying to produce more capital. And then you can take that capital and reinvest it back into higher margin forms of leverage or lower maintenance forms of leverage or um, more robust leverage, like different different things that kind of help you kind of climb that ladder. And you know, as, as the metaphor we use in the course is like building a mountain of levers. So you're adding new levers and you're extending the levers that you already have until over time, you're kind of building this giant edifice that like you sit on the top of and you can just kind of reach out and press levers and make things happen big heavy impossible things like with your with your long levers um but the other thing that is what we were we were talking about i think you set me up for is that like capital is an earner of itself and like you yeah. can put that you know um the the memorable metaphor we use in the course is like every dollar is an employee like make sure it has a good job make sure it has a high paying job put it to work either buy more leverage with it invest it in something you know whether that's whatever stuff you're comfortable with, whether it's the stock market, whether it's an index fund, whether it's, um, you know, buying a company like you did, whether it's buying a rental house, whether it's, 
um, I don't know, there's, there's so many opportunities, like put money to work. Um, and it's just this game of like, you know, spending or earning more than you spend until you can keep investing more than you're spending ideally. And then eventually like, you'll find out that your money's working harder than you are. And if you can kind of keep that earnings rate, like you're, you're free, you can retire, like you're yeah. done. Or you can live big, like whatever, you know, whatever, whatever <laughs> yeah. way you want to do it. One or the other. Yeah. All right, man. Um, well, we're at the top of the hour. Eric, this has been, like I said, I've really went into this conversation trying to find other things because I'm sure you've been like spitting this same philosophy for the last two years, but I just, I find it so interesting. And the way that you're able to deliver this material is so, so valuable. So, uh, okay, let's go ahead. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, like these are, these are fun. These are really fun conversations and this like going deeper and deeper into these ideas of leverage and how to apply them. Um, I find so satisfying and uh, this is about the deepest we've gotten into like practicing the framework and examples, I think in any interviews. So uh, cool. like, this is, this is really fun. Um, and I love it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Like what, when you were talking about building a mountain of levers, there's a, there's a book called Think and Grow Rich, which I'm sure a lot of people listening to this have read. This book had a huge impact on my life at a time when I really, really needed it. And I read it at the beginning of every year for the past like eight years. And there's a story in there where they're talking about Henry Ford and Henry Ford was put on trial for something. I'm not exactly sure what, I think it had to do with like competency. Like in the 1920s, being an aristocrat was like a big deal. And since he was like a blue collar guy, he was almost on trial for not being qualified to be like aristocratic, right? And, uh, and somebody was, um, was just asking him questions that he would have no idea, like how many British soldiers went to America in the Revolutionary War. And I remember he said, I don't know the answer, but I'm sure it's much less than went back. And then finally, they asked him another question. And he said, listen, I have a, a um, I was like a bunch of buttons, basically, for uh, telecoms that I can push and any question that you can ask me, I can get the answer to it in my five minutes. And he's like, so in a lot of ways, I'm more qualified than you to be sitting up here because I don't need to know everything. And so like when I visualize that, just this little box full of a bunch of buttons that in, 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 in this metaphor are the levers, right? There's yeah. nothing that he at that time didn't have access to from a simple box with some buttons on it. And when you said that building a mountain of levers, that was the exact uh, visualization and the exact story that, that came into my mind. And it's just so powerful once you start to apply these, man. So, so basically what I'm saying is your compliment uh, means a lot to me. And I'm glad that we could really extrapolate some of this. Me too. That's, that's amazing. That actually reminds me, my buddy Joe has like this little, uh, it's like a tiny little iPad that he has on his desk. And he's like, it's like a streamer deck. And he's like trained these hotkeys to do very specific like multi-step actions. And so if he's like looking through an email, he can press one button like off to his left, like Henry Ford, and it like automatically forwards to his assistant that's like carries out this set of things or like <laughs> automatically like sets a reminder for it. It's like, so, it's so cool. Um, so yeah, man, I didn't know he was like living that Henry Ford life. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so let's finish this up. We got, uh, um, well, I, I see your course is just on your website slash leverage. Is there a particular URL to this or is that just paste this URL in there? That one's good. Yeah. Ejorgensen.com slash leverage. That's, that's all the leverage stuff. I got a bunch of Twitter threads on there and I'll keep publishing new things, um, you know, on that, that site and, uh, start doing some of these leverage interviews on my podcast probably too, um, and sharing some of the stuff that's going on in the course. So. Excellent. So ejorgensen.com slash leverage is the course. Ejorgensen.com is your website. I think your Twitter is also just E Eric Jorgensen with a yep. C. I'm sure that people have been screwing that one up your entire <laughs> life. <laughs> um, all right, Eric, man, what a great conversation. I, I really appreciate your time. Uh, anything else that you want to say before we sign off? Oh man, I'm good. This is, this is fun. I hope we, uh, I hope we get to do it again. I yeah. appreciate you having me. Likewise. All right, man. Talk soon.